if you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast. It's episode 298. This is our 2024 Texas Children's Houston Open and Hero Indian Open Bets Pod. Barry O'Hanran and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss our selections for this week's PGA and DP World Tour action. Good morning, gents. Good morning, guys. Morning, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more information. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website where we have in depth betting previews, strokes gained rankings, player form stats, plus, of course, our predictor models. They're all available across both events this week. All of that content completely free of charge with no paywall. On X, you can follow us. Barry is at a good talk golf. Paul at golf betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel, where this podcast is available along with my weekly golf betting show. We're almost at four and a half thousand uh, subscribers on the YouTube channel. So mm. if you want to, just head across. Uh, I do a golf betting show every Monday, and of course, this podcast is on there every Tuesday as well. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. As ever, for those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. This review is from Paul Jackson, and Paul lives in Brentwood in Essex. I almost moved there once. When I was uh, coming back from university in Birmingham, I almost moved to Brentwood. Anyway, uh, excellent course knowledge. Get me on your show, five stars. I've been listening to you guys now for a fair few years and your knowledge of courses, tournaments and brilliant use of data has really helped guide me into finding winners. I have been listening for so long now. Even my other half, who isn't a particularly big fan of golf or punting, knows your theme tune off by heart. Over the years, the knowledge has stuck with me from your shows and I'm now at the point where I am intrigued to listen into who you've picked and whether we're on the same wavelength. I was with Paul on Hideki at Riviera and I'm certainly with Barry on the thought that Jake Knapp is going to do something special this year. Steve, I think it's time we give up on Keegan Bradley as well. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear. Is he going to... Yeah, that makes me laugh. For anyone who wants a great golfing podcast to listen to on the go, on the treadmill or your bike, then this is a great listen. When doing these activities, if you're looking to multitask and get fit at the same time, keep up the great work. P.S. I would love to get involved in your show one day and chew the fat with you three if you're looking for a one-off quartet. Thanks, Paul. That's much appreciated. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, we've never quite gone down that route of having a, a guest on the show, have we? Perhaps we'll have to give it some thought as to whether that can happen. I don't know if they'd get up this early. <laughs> no. No. What about you, Barry? It's a, co- a coffee podcast. I know you find it a struggle. Oh, well, I mean, the amount of bribery I had to go through to get on the show myself. It's, it's a, lot, <laughs> a lot of hoops. <laughs> a lot of hoops. People have been um, people have been messaging me via email, Twitter. So it's called X now. Blah 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 on YouTube, saying, "Steve, have you added Cam Young to your? <laughs> <laughs> have you added Cam Young to your post-it note of doom?" Nice. Do you know what? I actually, for me, I actually saw progress last week. I just thought that the best player on the day won the tournament. And Mal Nutty was in is was absolutely inspired. He, yeah. You were standing there and you were thinking, when's this guy gonna implode? Well I was anyway. When when's he gonna when's he gonna implode? And he and he stood on the fifteenth tee 
Uh, he got through the, the difficult 13th and 14th, didn't he, quite easily. In fact, I think he made birdie on one when Hughes made double. Yep. And then he stood on that tee box with the the water on the right and the and the uh, fairway going left to right, and you think, mm, this could be a problem. And he literally smokes it off the tee, the biggest fade you've seen in your life, to the middle of the fairway. You're like, well, he's that, ticked this one off. That shot was so beautiful. And then he gets to that final, he gets to that par three, and he just overcooks it, and it goes into that deep rough, and you think, hallelujah, the moment may have arrived. And then he gets the drop from heaven. <laughs> and at that point, I thought, hmm, right, might have done our dough here. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those, wasn't it? It was good to see, though. He's a good player, Malnati, and it does show that that golf course is very, very different to a lot of the PGA Tour where short game skills come to the fore. Mm. I, I really enjoyed the tournament. What were your thoughts? Liked it. I, having to shape shots is just very appealing to me because it just the course is asking you a particular question, and it's like can can you can you work with the course to answer that question? And mm-hmm. that tee shot from Malnadi on sixteen was just like kind yeah. of erotic. It was just he shaped the ball to match the, the how the hole flowed, um, mm-hmm. and to do that when he needed to, knowing the trouble that if he bailed out of that shot slightly in either direction he's in serious trouble it's uh that was a it was um you know a shot that a winner you know deserving of a winner got a lucky break on 17 but you need a little bit of a lucky break to to help you on the way to a win so you're not going to begrudge him that the thing the thing i found i found a fascinated my mind last week was the, that kind of strokes gained mental state and you know you're that the extra one or two percent that you know we're always trying to identify in players that will be the key factor that week, and he's been there's been a few headlines giving out a bit of crap about him getting invites into the the signature events or getting invites because of his status on the pack, and I wonder if that just gave him a little bit of motivation to be saying you know to think yeah. well, well to hell with you guys I'm going to show you I actually am deserving of these mm. maybe i wasn't yeah. in, maybe i wasn't technically in the first place but i'll show you i now i have the chance i'm gonna grab it and that could be a thing it could not it might not be but that was something that ran through my head and um i really enjoyed watching him go getting the win it was a it was a it was it was a good week and um a really really nice story and ending yeah no, impressive stuff. And it looked like he'd, because um, he started quite poorly, didn't he? Was, was he one over through four or five and um, didn't make anything on the par five. So he kind of looked at the leaderboard and, and assumed he was going to be one of those that just fell by the wayside, like a um, like a Keith Mitchell type. But um, yeah, really, <clears throat> really impressive. Good week from you though, Steve. Um, young um, Mackenzie Hughes up there as well. And um, you know there was a point where Hughes looked like he might well go and win that. He was making absolutely everything, wasn't he? He was just nailing yeah. these incredible parts. And if you were tracking his greens and regulation number, you knew Mackenzie Hughes wasn't going to win. <laughs> Sub fifty percent. Yeah. My God. When the when the putt is working like that, anything's possible. But yeah, I just, yeah. On, on the back nine, it, it, it wasn't. It couldn't last for seventy two holes. No. Uh, the wind, I think the wind, it, 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 I don't like it when caddies and players literally are standing there for three minutes on a tee box. Mm. And uh, that that was the killer, wasn't it, on the par three? He's, ba- he's airmailed it about 25 yards longer, you know, long. I think mm. he said in the interview it was 20 yards longer than it possibly could go. Yeah. It hit a gust and that was that. He got some nasty breaks in the bunkers, I'll give you that. Whenever he was in a bunker, he was in a he was in a terrible spot, wasn't he? Hughes. Yeah, just these fine fine margins that oh, yeah, for sure. can, can affect everything. But um, yeah, Cam Young gets added to my list of second place finishers. So oh yeah, but he's, he's not on the post it like those, Steve. Don't you? You can, you no, don't... I think he's going to win soon. Mm. It just you know it's just the odd silly poor putt here and there, wasn't it? But the way that he was actually striping the ball and the way he actually held it together. And let's be frank, it was, I must say, well, you know, if you look in the grand scheme of things, having a duke out with 
Mackenzie Hughes, Peter Malnati, um, Carl Yuan. It's a bit of an open goal, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of an open goal, but it's difficult to win on the PGA Tour. Yeah. Good God. People said Jimmy Walker. You remember that? Oh, all the years, Jimmy Walker never won. And then all of a sudden, he won one and literally... Oh, the had, floodgates open, yeah. Yeah, over two years, won loads of tournaments and won a major championship. So mm. you know, a lot of it's just people develop at different paces. What were your thoughts, Barry? I'll, I'll throw this one to you. What were your thoughts on Kashmir Keith Mitchell uh, with his <laughs> ability uh, to, to lead into a 54-hole leader? Um... I don't, I don't know, actually. It's just... Golf is mad. That course did some crazy things to people. Like, you know, with him on Sunday, uh, Justin Thomas on the Saturday, that just round out of nowhere when he all looked fine going into the, the day. It's... I don't know. It feels like once you're in the tornado, you can't get out of it. Mm-hmm. Not um, not not gonna not gonna help his happiness for the next few days. I'm sure you know when you go into Sunday with a two shot lead and you finish uh, uh, many many shots back. Yeah, yeah, disappointing for him. Seriously, the PGA Tour communication website said that that was only his second 54 hole lead of his career, Keith Mitchell, which okay. I found an amazing statistic for a player yeah. that's. Been around for a long time now, isn't he, Keith? Yeah, he's been in the vicinity. He, he, was, he was often a fast starter, wasn't he? And then kind of drifted away. It's one of those where you see a name earlier in the week or at some point in the week on the leaderboard, and then by Sunday, it's just no longer there. Mm. That's what did Ky- you and I do on Keith Mitchell, Barry? First oh, round leader. Oh, I made uh, I made negative ret- negative return on a winning bet. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's, it's the ultimate combination. <laughs> there's no, there's no bet. Mike last week, we the, said, we said Keith Mitchell, we're going to back him first round leader. Because as we've always said, starts well, finishes well on a Sunday when he's 10 shots behind. Uh, it all sort of came true, didn't it? He mm. finished sixth. <laughs> sixth first round leader. T- tied six to about eight hundred people. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, was, yeah. I, I had him six places each way, and I got. Oh, I don't think I got anything back. I didn't even check, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> couple of pence. Keith Mitchell. He's, um, he's, just he's, on JT before we move to DP World Tour, I am seeing JT right now at twenty-five to one to win the Masters. Mm. Thoughts. Have to brush up his putting a little bit, isn't he? He lost over seven strokes putting on Saturday alone. That's mad. That was a that's, horrible round for him, wasn't it? That's one he didn't, day. He didn't, didn't make anything outside of three feet, did he? Yeah, but hasn't he been putting better, like, let's say, this calendar year? Mm. So he's. I'm not sure about that. It's going to knock your confidence, though, Barry. It's not going to help. Mm. <laughs> um, I, he's, like, the, the play is better, the results are better. There's yeah, there's some I'd say edges that need to be tidied up. Mm. Sometimes like maybe maybe that's a day you just have to laugh off. You're like having thirty nine puts, you just kind of like strike it off in your brain as like an extreme anomaly and just like let it go. Just like okay, yeah, let's move on. Didn't happen. It's kind of I mean we've we've seen this so much, and if you if you're watching full swing at the moment from last you know last season, you you, you get a great episode on there with Ricky Fowler but it does you know Justin JT and what's happened to him and his and his you know his, his fall in form and game or whatever it is very Fowler-esque the, the problem with with JT is you don't get you don't really get Fowler prices do you that no. we were seeing last no. year no. no 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 but then I suppose over, over the fall he finished fifth fourth third and sixth so you know Pebble Beach he was sixth so everything was quite kind of nice then and it went 12th missed cut I was on him that week 12th at Phoenix he was actually sixth after 36 holes finished 12th missed cut at the Genesis 12th at the Arnold Palmer then uh, he was right in the mix there come Saturday afternoon fell back missed cut at the players and then 64th at the Valspar yeah Difficult. T- talk us through. Um, talk us through the Porsche Singapore 
classic Paul. I know you were on Paul Casey, who was there or thereabouts for long periods of the tournament. Mm. Yeah, finished sixth in the end. And if um, if anyone backed him, sixth, seventh places or whatever, um, then they'd have got a nice return. As I said last week, I'd backed him early and um, just to five places and a quarter. So I'm, that, that didn't work out particularly well. And as you say, he was there um, pretty much all week, wasn't he? Just hovered around that same kind of position. Um, I keep the, seeing him on par fives that he wouldn't birdie. Yeah, it's just frustrating and... The, the, there were opportunities there, and you know there, there was there was clearly the round there on Sunday to to give him the win. Um, had he mustered the kind of round that uh, uh, Jesper Jesper Svensson um, or um, Afi Barnrat managed to put together, that catapulted them from off the pace into into the playoff in the end. But um, yeah, it wasn't to be. Uh, impressive from Svensson. He's uh, he'd been knocking on the door with a couple of runner-up finishes over the last few months that had given us an indication that he was uh, he, he was close enough to uh, to get the win uh, nothing much last time out but that's the way it goes these guys on the DP World Tour aren't the most consistent so rarely do you see this sparkling form line that culminates in a uh, Matt Kuchar-esque style win um, but uh, yeah well done if you managed to back him there were a few I saw quite a few uh, few betting slips flying around over the weekend with Svensson on so uh, well done 66 70 to 1 that kind of number by the looks of it good stuff I didn't see many Molnarty winning slips no no you'd have done well to pluck him out I think to be his fair record, he, yeah, his record was terrible but his recent play was good so it wasn't it, was. it wasn't an absurd was. let's say you got an extended places price wouldn't have been a ridiculous bet yeah yeah. Then again, 14th wait, then, at, yeah, yeah. He finished fourteenth at the signature pebble. Miss uh, miss cut ninth at the P, at PJ National, and he'd been he 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 did hit my radar, Malnati, because he was twenty fourth heading into the final round at the players. Shot a sixty six on Saturday. Then he shot eighty one. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. what I think put everybody off. Mm. But that's, but so that's, yeah, you're that, right. That's Four, fourteenth and the ninth in his last four, and he was going off at two hundred and fifty to one. Yeah, and the ninth at PJ National was very. That that's one that would really kind of peak your uh, raise an eyebrow, and that you know the difficulty yeah. of the course and how it, you know, it analogizes yeah. with um, Copperhead. Mm. Very it, much so. Like people would have questioned your sanity a little bit on the bet, but it wasn't the worst long shot if you did pluck it last week so if anybody did absolutely amazing you are definitely on the podcast next week <laughs> he is added to a list that is 150 to 1 400 to 1 300 to 1 125 to 1 70 to 1 100 to 1 80 to 1 50 to 1 100 to 1 150 to 1 and now 250 to 1 with peter malnati that's is a list of the prices who have won on the PJ Tour in 2024. The only person to break that spell at 13 to 2 favourite and 11 to 2 favourite, of course, is Scotty Scheffler. It's been the most bizarre year for golf betting on the PJ Tour that I can remember. Let's move to the next instalment. It's a catchy name. It's the Texas Children's. It's all about the children. Houston Open, which they are playing on the Memorial Park Golf Course. Right, I'm going to, I've actually noticed this week, though. Uh, I'm going to highlight William Hill, best bookmaker for this particular tournament. They've gone eight places each way at 50 odds on their default Houston market. Gives you a great... Uh, I must say, their prices this week are exceptional. Uh, good opportunity to maximise your return with that eight places. Uh, as we record this podcast on Tuesday morning in the UK, they are best odds on Wyndham Clark, Will Zalatoris, Tony Finau, Jason Day, Sue Woo Kim, Alex Naren, Kashmir, Keith Mitchell. The list goes on and on. If you are 18 plus and do not have a William Hill account... You can find details of their bet £10, get £30 of free bets, new customer promotion. Plus a link through to that very offer with T's and C's in this podcast description. I got a few of my bets away 
with William Hill this week. Uh, yeah, decent proposition. We're two weeks away from the Masters. It's good to see the Houston Open. I'm going to call it the Houston Open <coughs> for this point. Um, I'm not going to constantly call it the Texas Children's Houston Open. It's all about the children on the PGA Tour. Can you hear the cynicism? Um, we're talking about a golf course this week that's been freshly extended, just to, to really twist the knife. Yeah. 7,435 yards. Wow. And it's a par 70. <laughs> I categorise it as a mid-score golf course, which is long in length. Oh, that was a good ca- good categorisation, <laughs> Steve. Um. I believe, and I can't guarantee this because I haven't looked at my weather report, but I believe it also hammered down with rain yesterday on Monday. I know for a fact there was 44 millimetre of rain last week. Um, Barry is going to go into um, meltdown mode, I think, because when Jason Kokrag won here in 2021 and Carlos Ortiz won here in 2020, this golf course was a real animal. Um, it was firm, it was fast, it was fiery. And I don't think we're going to get that this, this week. Sorry. So I think, the P, I think the PGA Tour will have done their PGA Tour 2024 work on it. And <laughs> the rain hasn't helped. I was about to Double say, have they, have they graduated from using the local fire department to seeding the clouds? Just to make yeah. sure that the course is so Yeah. They've got a plane up there seeding clouds to make sure it just rains. It's it's a cheaper cheaper alternative to getting 17 uh, fire department trucks out on the course every day. And of course, what else have they done, Barry? They've overseeded the golf course. Well, you have to to make it look green, don't you? Yeah, you can't, you can't, to make it green, yeah. You can't have it looking anyway, anything other than a violent emerald shade of green. Listen, yeah. the overseeding is done to keep yeah keep the courses playable. Like if it goes dormant, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some good agronomy reasons, a little bit of aesthetics reasons. I'm I'm not gonna pretend, um, is- I'm not gonna pretend to know that much deeper on it, but other than the visuals, it's gonna make it a bit easier. I think in um, in March more. This is from my uh, re- preview. In March, Memorial Park will feature overseed, which will provide a much tighter playing surface than the Bermuda grass. Did last time we were here in 2022. This will undoubtedly highlight the penal green surrounds. While shorter, less intense rough will, as per the PGA Tour way these days, give more opportunity for aggressive approach shots to green. So basically, they've cut the rough back. They've um, added perennial ryegrass to the rough, which I believe makes it a little bit easier because it isn't 100% Bermuda now. There's a mix. Mm. And... The weather has done di- done its work to soften the golf course. The one thing I will say about this course, and one of the things I really liked about it, bearing in mind we, we used to see this in October, November, when it was part of the fall series. Now it's been moved pre-Masters, which is the usual spot that the Houston Open was always in, now that the World Golf Championship match play has disappeared. This is clearly taking its place. But what you do get here is get you lots of sh- uh, lots of runoff areas around elevated greens. So actually, from a prep perspective, mm. I can see why some of the players are choosing this rather than Valero next week. Because from a from a chipping in closely mown areas kind of perspective, which is all about Augusta, this is brilliant prep. Really, really good prep. There's a lot of approach shots that hit greens and used to. I'm not saying they do this week. They used to kind of roll off that green complex to sort of 30, 40-yard collection areas. Yeah. Mm. And there was also talk, because a lot of these green complexes are elevated, when you were coming out of thick Bermuda grass rough, it was a disaster because you couldn't get the ball to stick on the greens and then you had these 30 to 40-yard chip shots back onto the green. That's what made this course so difficult. And the course doesn't feature many bunkers. It's only got 23 bunkers, which was something that Tom Doak and Brooks Kepka, who helped re-renovate this course, were all about. They didn't want to put bunkers around greens because in the PJ2 approach, find bunkers easy. What they struggle with are 
chips from 25 through 40 yards onto elevated greens because that creates all manner of indecision as do I putt it, do I chip it, what do I do here? Mm. But anyway, I think it's going to have been a little bit dumbed down this week, but I still think it's going to put up some fairly, you know, this isn't going to be a, um, a an American Express 27 under job. I'm thinking the, it, Texas golf is so heavily about wind and the strength of the wind. It doesn't look too bad this week either. I mean, Thursday looks dead calm. Thursday is the day where you've literally got to shoot six, seven under, get yourself to the top of the leaderboard, um, mm-hmm. and then just hold on from there. I reckon 14 to 16 under par. Or maybe, Barry, the ubiquitous 17 under par wins this week. Mm. Welcome to the PGA Tour. I think we should spend less time focusing on what the score will be and more on which of the triple-digit players that are playing this week will win. It it should be... It should be um, there's no real rain there in the forecast that I'm seeing, so... Maybe, no, no, maybe it's going to dry, dry out. Maybe it'll dry yeah, out. It will so dry out. It should, it should develop into an interesting... Hopefully yeah. Saturday and Sunday you start to see a little bit of release and a bit of interest yeah. on approach shots. So I know I shouldn't say this, but I don't think you're going to see any LC and P in play this week. I don't think there's going to be any lift cut. Lift, what do they call it? Lift? Clean and place. Yeah, clean and place. I don't think you're going to see that. But it will, yeah, over time. I and mean, it's going to be a nice 25, 27 degrees. That course will dry. It just depends on what the PGA Tour want to do. I'd like to think that the greens by Saturday, Sunday are releasing and we're seeing a proper a proper um, tournament. Mm. Surely the pros would want that with Mark, with August yeah, a couple of yeah. weeks away. Yeah. Bit of a challenge. Um, a couple of other things I want to highlight. First of all, in terms of... Um, this is the last tournament on the on the world rankings before the Masters Top 50 cutoff, the second one. So as of Monday, anyone in the Top 50 that wasn't already exempt will get a Masters invite. Now, personally, I don't like that from a player's perspective. Now, you could say to yourself, that's going to really motivate players. In my, I don't know, in my mind and when looking back at at just history on this, I think that will probably go the other way and scare the living daylights out of a lot of these. So I've got a list here. Tom Hoagie, Mackenzie Hughes, Alex Noren, who's very popular this week at 33 to 1, who's never won on the PGA Tour. Keith Cashmere Mitchell, Stefan Yeager. Robert McIntyre, Thomas Dietrich, they are all between 57 and 75 in the world. And a win, or even for the likes of a Hoagie, a Hughes, probably a top two, something like that, would likely get them into the Masters on a top 50 in the world exemption. I'm staying away from them. That, that's the decision I've made. Now, on the course, this is another thing I really want to highlight. It's a really rare course. I know they've played this three times, so the data isn't full. But if you look at strokes gained per round, this course is a bit of a sort of strange one. It works out at two points. This is for the winners here. 2.08 strokes per round gained from T to green and 1.9 strokes gained Strokes gained putting made up the winning total. So that is 52% from tee to green and 48% on the greens. That is a split. The only other split I've seen like that on the PGA Tour is Quail Hollow. Where players that win that have the putting performance of their life to win it. Mm. I mean, that kind of makes sense when you look at what Phil Mickelson always used to do at Quail Hollow. Wyndham Clark won there last year, topped strokes game putting at Quail Hollow. This course seems very, very similar. You've got to have an exceptionally good week on the greens. And that has helped shape my selections for the Houston Open. Is there anything else you guys want to say before we move on to our selections? 
No, I don't think so. I think you covered it all there, Steve. Clear. Where are you chipping in at, chaps? Um, 25, 50 and three figures for me. Not short. Yeah. I hope it, are you guys on Hoagie, Hughes, Norren, Mitchell, Jaeger, McIntyre or Dietrich? Nope. That'd be nope. quite amusing if you were. <laughs> nope. No. None no. of those. Okay. Right. Get the elephant out of the room first. I am on Scotty Scheffler at three to one. I've gone eight points to win. If there's one player that I think can have a astronomical tea to green week and win this by gaining half a stroke per round on the greens, which is more than possible these days with Scotty and his new putter. I think it's Scotty Scheffler. The thing, that's, the thing that really swung it for me, well, there were two. Firstly, I think Scotty's got to the stage now where he intimidates players around him when it comes to Sundays, and this field is not the deepest. The other thing that really got me over the line this week with Scotty was that he is four to one with Paddy Power to win the Masters in two weeks' time. And I was grabbing him at three to one to win the Houston Open. I thought, oh, I'll just take that. It's like a, it's almost like an insurance policy now, knowing that Scotty Scheffler is more than likely on a Sunday to be right at the top of the leaderboard fighting with various players to win. And actually, you look at this field, I don't think it's overly deep. No. Yes, it's got Wyndham Clark in there. And Wyndham Clark is clearly playing probably, well, I wouldn't say the best golf of his career, but he's playing the most elevated golf over a period of time that we've seen from him going back to the middle of last year when he clearly won at Quail Hollow and then the US Open. He's on a completely different level now, Wyndham Clark. So 12-1, to 1, get that. Will Zalatoris, yeah, Sahid Tagala. And then we're kind of down to Jason Day, who seems horrible, you know, 25-1. Uh, uh, to 1. Shouldn't say he's horribly out of form. I think that might be incoming. But you've got Tony Fee and Siwoo Kim. Yeah, I don't know. The field really tapers off quickly here. So I'm on Scotty at 3-1. to 1. Feels a bit John Rahm at the Open de Spagna to me. And we know with Scotty that two years ago when he won the Masters, I think he won, I think it was four tournaments in six outings. So yeah, I'm on him. I'm also on Sahid Tagala, who seems to be hitting it longer, straighter, higher than he ever has done, and can putt. And can putt with ridiculously big spike weeks. So I think this course could be perfect for Sahid Tagala. And actually, he got his PGO Tour maiden victory last year at the Fortinet. I think if he won this this week, it would be a bit of, for him. This would be a bit of yeah. You know what? I'm now arrived on the PGO Tour. I'm beating players like Scotty Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Will Zalatoris, Jason Day, Tony Fina where the Fortinet Championship was one of those ones that was a bit of a soft field and he just smoked it. Mm. So I could see him really keeping that foot to the floor because he's been playing some great stuff this year, Tagala. So I'm on Scheffler and Tagala at the top of the market. Uh, Paul, take us through your 25-1 to 1 shot. Um, yeah, before I do, I'm just talking Scheffler, I, I haven't backed Scheffler, but the bet that... I'm toying with is the dual forecast with Scheffler and um, Wyndham Clark, which is 25 to one. Um, it's difficult to see Scheffler out of the mix. And the last two events have finished Scheffler, or the last two events that he's played Scheffler first, Clark second. So yeah. it's not out of the realms of possibility. You see the same result again this week. So if, yeah, I, I, I say I haven't backed that. that. That's the one number I've, I've been looking at. Um, the player I have backed, twenty-five to one, is the horribly out of form Jason Day that you just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, if someone's going to beat Scheffler this week, then it's going to have to be someone of the kind of major quality that Jason Day is and has been in the past. Thirteen wins, three of those wins, don't forget, did come in Texas. 
2016 match plays. Won the Byron Nelson twice, including last year. Mm. Uh, six foot pebble, ninth Riviera. I mean, yes, I, I get what you're saying about the last couple of starts. Although he did open with 67 at Sawgrass. He was right up there after the first round, just couldn't quite keep it going. But prior to that, in decent fields, sixth at pebble, ninth Riviera. Second into Sunday here in 2020. So he can play the course. Um, mm. Not much action. I, 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 I can see that there isn't much love for Jason Day this week, but 25 to 1. Um, I thought I'd be a little bit contrarian and, uh, and and go for that this week. I'd probably take Jason Day over Tony Finau if it comes to horribly out of form. Mm. Because Finau is struggling badly, mate. Really badly. Yeah, and defending this week, belatedly. Doesn't help, does it? There's a couple of things. In terms of Scottish Sheffield, I think the only thing the bookmakers are probably hoping is that his neck injury has continued. But you and I were talking about this yesterday, Paul. If, if Scottish Scheffler still had a neck injury, I don't think A, he'd still be in the field, and B, he'd probably just swap and say, I'm going to play the Falera Texas Open next week. Yeah, mm. he doesn't need to play to prove that or prove to himself that he's in the kind of form that is um, yeah. going to put him in the mix at the Masters. He... he Obviously, wants to play and keep going prior to the Masters, hence the reason why he's here. But um, you'd imagine that if he wasn't a hundred percent, that he'd do the honourable thing and uh, and withdraw. <laughs> it doesn't always work like that in golf, does it? I received an email, uh, sorry, a tweet over the the uh, week or overnight from Shawshank at Shawshank saying, "Steve, done some digging." I believe that Scotty's home course of Royal Oaks in Dallas features Mini Verdi Bermuda Grass Greens, which is the same format of green that we're seeing here at Houston. And he says, I assume that this time of year that they will be equally as overseeded, which is a very valid point. So you might even find that Scott is playing on greens that literally he practices on every week back at home in Dallas. Mm. <clears throat> so interesting information right Barry where are you coming in at Paul's on Jason Day where, where's your first uh, stake in the sand this week we're on uh, Jake Knapp hmm interesting so I like the the width off the tee is beneficial to his slightly less than accurate uh, driving numbers this year. He has mm-hmm. more than enough length to make life easy for himself on uh, approach shots, be hitting you know, a bit more loft into the par threes than others. Uh, you know, a couple of middling performances, but cuts made um, after his win. So, you know, his form line was first, fourth, 57th, 45th. A week off to reset the batteries, and uh, off we go. These yep. fairways are thirty-five to forty yards wide at landing area, so it, they're wide. Yeah. For me, uh, the, uh, Nap is one of them. Definitely, this this golf course is all about power off the tee and players that are s- streaky putters. Who can have a really good putting week? Yep. So yeah, Nap, I can see that. My 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 second is Nap as well. I've backed back Nap at fifties. Um, just to back you up there, Barry, he gained four strokes putting at Sawgrass, and I've looked down his list. I know we've not got much um, wow. um, much experience. They're similar greens, aren't they? With that power trivia, yeah, yeah. And, and and I know he's not played many. Uh, events where we've got strokes gained putting or strokes gained against his name, but that his is his career best recorded strokes gained putting performance so far, and I think this suits better. I think this suits better than Sawgrass, anyways. Longer course, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, more to his dimensions, as you say, from a width of the tee perspective. Last time he played in um, Texas, he was seventh on the Corn Ferry Tour, so um, you know, a little bit of positive vibe coming into this week and. You know, we've talked about it, 50 to 1. That's the, the kind of price where he won a few weeks back and he's back out to the same price. And I think there's more to come from this player over the course of this season and ongoing. So I'm Would happy you, to jump on. It's astonishing that his price is back out there versus others mm. ahead of him in the betting. 
I yeah. just I'm saying thank you very much. He's fifties and not like thirty threes. Absolutely. Take it. I'm seeing right now, if you're prepared to just take five places each way, fifty five to one with Bet Fred. Mm. <clears throat> that is longer than Aaron Rye. I mean that's crazy and Bo Hoslow never wins. Mm-hmm. Yep. Might have to get my phone out later when uh, we stop recording this. <laughs> Cracking bet. I've gone for two of the same ilk to finish off my team. I've gone for Kurt Kitayama. That won't surprise regulars. I, I mentioned him a lot. I've got 55 to 1 with William Hill, eight places each way on Kitty Armour. He's a kind of Jake Knapp. He hits it a hell of a long way and he can have extremely streaky putting weeks. And when I look at his um when I look at his numbers across my eight week trackers, he's prevalent across everything, including putting. Oh, just to scare you even more, Scotty Scheffler's now in my top twenty five for strokes game putting in this mm. field over the last eight weeks. Yeah. Scary. Um 19th at Sawgrass, Kitty Armour. And that, to me, you just said that about Jake Knapp. If I was to make a list of courses that suit Jake Knapp, I think Sawgrass would be down there with a kind of harbour town. Mm-hmm. You know, right at the base of that list. Doesn't yep. suit at all. Um, I think Kitty Armour's in the same boat there. For me, he likes a wide golf course. I mean, he won at Bay Hill, for Lord's sake, at 200-1. to 1. So wide fairways, tick. Long golf course, tick. Something that puts up some resistance, tick. Um, this is a guy that finished sixth at the PGA Tour, uh, Championship last year. So, yeah, I thought Kirk Kitayama at 55-1 to 1 was a decent bet. He was 19th at Sawgrass last time out. Interestingly enough, 12 months ago, Kirk Kitayama made the quarterfinals of the world match play at Austin Country Club, which is a couple of hours down the road from here. Those greens there, Bermuda, Poa, Trivialis. Final one, um, a guy that won at the Vow Spa last year at Copperhead, Taylor Moore. Again, exactly the same ilk as the players we've already gone through. Long off the tee, seriously high ball flight. <clears throat> also, very streaky putter. He ranks 50th for driving distance all drives, 20th for greens in regulation so far this year on tour. Love the fact that he won on Bermuda Poa Trivialist Greens at Valspar last year. And he's got a couple of fourth places at the team event they play at TPC Louisiana, the Zurich Classic, with Matt Neesmith. Again, those greens are exactly the same. They are mini Verdi Bermuda, overseeded with Poa Trivialis. So I think Taylor Moore is coming into some kind of form. Interestingly, about all the players that we've so far put up, Moore, Kitayama, Tigala, Scheffler, Jason Day and Jake Knapp, they are all in the field for the Masters, which I think is a good thing. They will not be stressed or worried about where they are in the, in the leaderboard, the rankings, any of that malarkey. They're qualified, they're done. So I, I think that's a good thing in terms of being able to focus very clearly this week on having a good week at Memorial Park. Right, any any longer shots, please, chaps? I'm done. Mm. I've got one. Um, I'm sticking with Joel Damon this week. The um, I, I, I couldn't quite fathom it, but there was 125 to 1 dangled out there with six places yesterday, so I took that. Um, no doubt he'll finish seventh now. Um, but he's got some good form here at Memorial Park, fifth and ninth from his two starts. Couldn't quite get it going on the greens last week, but even so, third for strokes gain approach, 15th for strokes gain tee to green. His long game is in good health right now. Um, 11th before that, as I said last week, at TPC Sawgrass, which was in much better company this week. Strokes gained bucket hat this week. Perhaps he'll uh, tap nice. into some of that. Uh, <laughs> perhaps he'll tap into some of that Malnati magic from last week and uh, yeah. make it a bucket hat. Double this week. That's the only other one for me. What about you, Barry? Do you mind if I join you on Damon? Go for it, Barry. Go for it. 
we can cross we can cross win with each other or cross lose with each other. Yeah, why not? Joe, Joe, forecast Barry. We can retire on this. Now there is a bet. <laughs> Your she- the Scheffler Clark one just can't happen. Not three times in a row. So yeah, right, that's I the know. one. There. Reverse forecast Nap and Damon. Mm. Could be the one. Should we move on to the Hero Indian Open, Paul? Mm. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, Hero Indian Hero Indian Open. Um, second week of this Asian swing we've got on the DP World Tour and then the tour takes a break next week before the Masters as it as it has done historically and then it resumes once we come back from Augusta um, pretty typical looking betting market actually um, none of the big names that we had last week so just the odd addition here and there Rasmus Huygard is the 14 to 1 favourite this week Jordan Smith 18 to 1 Ewan Ferguson, 22 to 1. One of the additions is Anibarn Lahiri, 22 to 1 for the live player who's uh, popped along on his in his homeland this week to play. Uh, Richard Mansell, Bernd Wiesberger, Yannick Paul, Joost Lauten, all of them 25 to 1, 28 to 1 bar those players. Plenty of each-way options this week, again, as per usual. Ball Sports, eight each-way. You've got the same option with Bet365 through their each-way extra proposition. Coral and Labrooks have stepped up a little this week as well. Seven places each-way, fifth of the odds um, on this from both Coral and Labrooks. So there's lots of options out there if you prefer your places over odds. I must say, I've placed all of mine this week. Um, with longer prices and shorter each way terms so no doubt like Paul Casey that will come back to bite me on the backside this weekend but um, you've got to he who dares hey eh? you've got you've got to have a got to have a go in this game haven't you now in terms of the venue we used to play this at the short tight Delhi golf club and that was always a good event to preview because it was so um, particular in the kind of style of player that you might want to pick. They moved this to the Gary Player um, design at the DLF Golf and Country Club back in 2017, and it's a very different beast, this. Um, I described it last week as crazy golf. It is a really quirky layout, um, and that's that's being polite, I think. It can measure nearly 7,700 yards off the back tees. The official length this week is 7,416 yards par 72 the organizers do tend to mess around with it a little so um they can play with different tees there's lots of elevation changes here as well so it doesn't necessarily play to that full 7400 yards some rounds um some some of the years that have been played they've played it sub 7000 um in some of the rounds so that shows you how much they can and do play with this so don't take the 7400 as gospel this week um because it can it can and does change. It's Parkland in style. Uh, there's water in play on six of the holes. Pretty severe bunkering. Very big greens. Um, Bermuda grass has been used throughout from tee to green as well. Now, in terms of the weather, it does look set fair. Um, hot and sunny. Temperatures in the high 30s centigrade. So that's approaching 100 Fahrenheit. So it's going to be hot and sticky. Very little wind as well, 5 to 10 miles an hour, so nothing untoward in that respect. The challenge will be purely what the course presents the players this week, nothing from the elements by the looks of it. Now we've got um, four events that have been played here on the DP World Tour. There's a couple on the uh, PGTI Tour as well that um, have been played on this um, since 2017. All of those form part of the core stats on the site this week, so... Um, I have put a little, little asterisk by the um, by the PGTI results just so you can differentiate those that were on the DP World Tour. But if you're flicking through the stats, there's six renewals or six events now that you can get a view as to the kind of player who can and does perform around these parts. In terms of the DP World Tour, going back to 2017, that was SSP Chowraja's year, 10 under par. 80 to 1 and that that shows you what I described about the course length before because Chowraja is right down at the bottom in terms of length of the tee yet he managed to win and win quite comfortably here back in 2017 um, on 
what's described as a pretty long course. 2018, Matt Wallace, 11 under, 66 to 1. 2019 was Stephen Gallagher, 9 under, 150 to 1. Then they had a break. 2023, last year, Marcel CM won at 14 under par. CM was 33 to 1 last year when he broke his long winless streak here. As I said, varying lengths off the tee. Chow Razia was 67 for those who made the cut. I expect that was 67th of 67. Marcel Siem was 5th, so different lengths off the tee. Um, Wallace and Chow Razia, both of them only hit two-thirds of greens, um, scrambled and putted really, really well. Whereas Gallica, 76% of greens in regulation. Siem, 86% of greens hit last year. So... Two different ways to get um, your way around this course. You can either just, as I say, hit lots of greens or you can scramble and putt really, really well. Either way, it's quite a challenging test. Now, the fairways don't seem particularly difficult to find here. Um, so typically 70, even into the 80% bracket is is fairly typical. Even those in the 60s, are, you know, that, that's kind of way down the way down the list in terms of that statistic so it's more about what you can do on your approach shots more about what you do around these huge greens when you do miss the greens and we do have some strokes gain data from last year only the top three and that was marcel cm yannick paul who i was on last year and yost Loughton. they ranked ninth second and fourth for strokes gain t to t to green respectively uh, CM was first for strokes going off the tee. Paul was first for strokes going approach. So I think you're going to have to see something, um, one of the elements in your long game fire um, over the course of the four days to get yourself into contention. Um, other than that, again, we've got relatively few renewals. CM and Wallace both came in off the back of a top 20 finish. So there was a bit of form there. Actually, Chowrasia, um had finished 35th the week before or the start before, and that was the best result of his season to date. So there's a case here for players who are just starting to show some form, just start, starting to show that their season is kind of uh, uh, coming to life, is starting to starting to head towards a peak, potentially. Uh, the, the, the one that uh, goes against all of that is Stephen Gallico, who came in off the back of four straight missed cuts when he won. So, um, yeah, good luck if you manage to to pluck that one out i think the main thing this week is the difficulty of the course um it's being able to shrug off the bogeys the double bogey there'll be plenty of double bogeys this is, this is a kind of event where as a punter you kind of then almost look at the screen or the or the app because there's disaster looming literally on every hole and a player that can be going well can suddenly make double double and take himself right out of the uh Right out of the mix. So, uh, yeah, thick skin needed this week, I think. Um, but, yeah, those players, you can take those doubles, take those bogeys on the chin, keep plodding, plodding along. I think that's uh, that's the kind of player that we need need this week. Um, kind of punter we need this week, one who can take those uh, take those on the chin. I've back four anyway. Um, I can't get involved at the very top of the market. Uh, Rasmus Hoygaard, again, another good position last week. Um, and then shot 76 on the Saturday to take himself out of it. Jordan Smith, again, 18 to 1, he blows hot and cold. Um, he played well a couple of weeks back, then um, first round leader last week, and then um, just drifted away. Uh, I was tempted by Yannick Paul. Again, as I said, I was on him last year, five clear at halfway, and then just got reeled in by Marcel CM, but nothing much last week. Um, and I, as I said, I, I kind of want these players who seem like they're just heading towards a peak um, now. So the first one for me is a player who's done just that, and that's Yost Loughton, 25 to 1. Now, Yost, he hasn't won since 2018. Um, that was at the Oman Open back then. But we keep seeing these long, winless droughts ended. Again, Peter Malnati last week's another case in point there. Closed with a 66 last week. Um, that was a tie for 11th. And he comes back to a course this week where he finished ninth on debut, um, third last year. And both times he's played here, he's had some really strong all-round performances. He's uh, He ranked eighth and fourth for greens and regulation on his two visits here uh, and those two renewals. Really enthused by the state of his game 
Yoast. Um, he, he does lay it all bare on his uh, blog, so um, always well worth a read if you're interested in backing Yoast on any particular week, just to see what he's saying. But he seemed really enthused about his game. Um, was a little bit down on his driving, yet he still hit over 70% of fairways last week, so I think he's a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to his driving. He's the kind of player that I think goes well here. He hits stacks of greens when he's playing well. He's third for scrambling this season so far on the DP World Tour. And um, generally putting much better over the last months and, and a year or so than he had been historically. So this seems to fa- set up to, to be a nice course, nice week for Yost, potentially where he gets win number seven of his career, I think, at 25 to 1. So Yost's in, um, also backed Jeff Winter. Uh, 60 to 1 is the best price now. There was a little bit of 70s yesterday. Been nibbled in a bit. He finished on the same total as Yost last week, uh, last week um, 11 under. And actually, he finished with two bogeys in his final five holes. So had he just managed to par or even make a birdie coming home, um, I think he'd have been a far shorter price for this week than he is. Hasn't got the course form of Yost. Um, in fact, the one time he played here uh, last year, uh, he missed the cut. So yeah, n- nothing to nothing to shout about there. But in terms of correlating courses or, or correlating uh, difficulty, is probably the best way to put it. I think there's plenty to like. He won a Mallorca back in 2021. Uh, that was at 15 under, and that's on a course that can really be quite challenging. Got a couple of Nordic League wins at single digit under par winning scores as well so um some indication there that he can do uh he, he can grind i suppose eighth the belfry last year second at the golf national which is a good um uh, comp course i think sixth at andalusia last year as well they're all good pointers uh, i think he can go well this week 13th on the tour currently for three part avoidance with these huge greens i think those players who can um also avoid disastrous three putts should be considered and he's, he's right up there on that particular statast- statistic at uh, two longer prices uh, Simon Forstrom uh, 100 to 1 now uh, at best price uh, generally about 80 to 91 90 to 1 now again another one who's just been nibbled in since yesterday but um, he showed some form last week top 10 heading into the weekend in Singapore um, didn't quite happen but uh, perhaps he'll take some inspiration from his uh, fellow Swede Jasper Svensson's win last week and uh, emulate him this week uh, he actually finished uh, double bogey bogey on Sunday so again he's one of these players who I think his final position um, doesn't fully indicate where or how well he was playing I think if he'd have finished par par or par birdie then again we'd be getting nothing like three figure quotes about him this week he'd have finished alongside uh, Jost Lauten and Jeff Winter actually had he finished par par um, suggests to me that he might uh, might be one of those players that's just going to start to come into a little bit of form and again that, that's really what I like this week he won last year's Sudal Open um, got a couple of Nordic Tour wins as well won on the Challenge Tour so he's not afraid to, to win when the opportunity comes 8th here last year as well he was 7 under through 11 holes on the Sunday I mean that's some feat on this particular course to be threatening a really low score um, settled for a 67 in the end finished 8th I think he could pick up from where he left off last year and uh, and push on this week Simon Forstrom final one and then I'll bring you guys in Matthew Baldwin I backed yesterday 100 to 1. No love for him, actually. This place has gone out to 125s this morning. So if you fancy Baldwin, you're getting a better price than I managed to yesterday. Now, Baldwin got his breakthrough win uh, last year, uh, last March, actually. It's uh, a big tick in the box for for you biorhythm fans. And I do think there's some, some validity in that argument. Players do often peak at similar times of year for whatever reason that was a sdc championship he won that by a full seven strokes we touched on it a couple of weeks back when we've previewed that event he absolutely lapped the field and that was a tricky event um also won the 2019 journey to jordan that was on the mena tour by eight shots so he's proven twice now that when everything clicks he can absolutely run away with a title and uh, it's not out of the realms of possibility that you see another runaway winner in this kind of event, this kind of course. So 
if there's going to be one, perhaps it is Matthew Baldwin. 30th year last year, that was off the back of a couple of missed cuts. So he's in better overall form coming into this, I think. 15th at Glendower, closed with a pair of 66 that week. Uh, 70th last week will be the, the number that puts many punters off. But if you look back, he'd finished 60th the week before in Kenya, before going out and winning that SDC championship by seven. So um, perhaps we can look at it as a kind of a throttled down performance last week. Knew he wasn't going to win. Um, took a small check, reset, come out this week and uh, and see where he gets to. In terms of his long game last year, when he came in and finished 30th, it was really quite impressive. So I think if he can get the putter going this week, he could really be one of those dark horses we shall see Matthew Baldwin Simon Forstrom Jeff Winther and Yost Loughton my four players this week now Barry I know you're never particularly keen on the DP World Tour is there is there anything that I can say to convince you to back one of mine well that's not true I love the DP World Tour I just <laughs> hate my ability like to, betting on it. <laughs> I hate my ability to pick a player that could actually stand a chance of competing for four rounds mm. I, I genuinely think it's uh i should be socially responsible and not mention any players names for fear that a listener will get it in their head that it's a good idea to back them mm. um yeah i don't i can't remember the last time i've had more than a chopped place on the dp world tour yeah. Top, top place would have been nice last week. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've can't, like, if anything that was going to lead me towards players, I would, you know, just look at strokes gained approach last week and maybe merge that with somebody who's not a horrific putter. Mm. Just noticing, looking at Aki Stridham uh, went well for in strokes gained approach last week. He was top five. Uh, it, it's. Yeah, I know. I've, I've I've got to I've got to come off Oki yeah. Oki Strudum um, because he's he's not getting into the positions where he's, he's re- or even threatening to reward us from a even an each way perspective. But it, that all said, I think there's a little bit there's, there's something percolating there, and it still wouldn't surprise me over the next few weeks and months to, to, just to see him come and win another title, just from you know almost out of the blue off the back of uh, some seemingly pretty slack in coming form but like probably in south africa yeah probably yeah it's um well, I, yeah, I think he when it all clicks he can he can win anywhere really yeah wait about you steve anything uh anything catch your eye i had one bet last night go on i backed him last week his name's burnt wiesberger mm. Yeah, it's a danger. If I manage to sneak 30 to 1. Yeah, it is a danger. Quality player in this field. Yeah, a bit of course. Um, he's got course experience. He's tw- he played in 2019. 23rd. Yeah, they yeah they had a few years off, so there's a bit of a break between the events. But yeah, there's... Um, yeah, there's, 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 there's enough I did go to go through last year as well, didn't I? His results, when he goes off the beaten track, uh, over to... Yeah, you know, Asia and whatever the yeah. subcontinent, cracking. Yeah. So, um, in a world of craziness on the DP World Tour, he slowly dragging himself towards the summit of a leaderboard. I think it might happen this week. Mm. I think it will be crazy this week. It's, it's, it, listen, this, this is always a really interesting watch, and it's, um, it's it's an interesting week. And if you can get someone in the mix, it can be. Uh, yeah, it, it, can, it can be good fun, um, but equally it can be pretty painful. So, um, one of those masochistic weeks if you like betting on golf, because um, your player could do absolutely anything. We'll see. I think that's us, chaps. Yes, yeah, all good. Yes, we need to start formulating our plans for the Masters. Um, I am on Wyndham Clark already. I managed to get a 50 to 1 bet on him a few weeks ago. Uh, full disclosure, I've also backed Dustin Johnson in the last seven days. I managed to get, I think it was 40 to 1 on Betfair Exchange on DJ. So those are my first two bets for the 2024 Masters. Have you two had any bets? Not yet for me, no, no. Keep my powder dry for a little bit longer. 
Just just my one from last year on Max Homa, which at forty to one now makes me the your Wyndham Clark bet at fifty to one feels uh, like a nicer bet now, based on recent weeks. Although Max isn't playing bad, the extra ten points is nice. Mm. Mm. Won't be long, chaps. Won't be long. We will be doing a special Masters Research podcast, as we do every year, for listeners. So bear that in mind. That will be. I think we're recording at the end of next week. So yeah, that will be available very, very soon. I hope your bets go well with this week, champs. Yeah, best of luck, boys. You too, guys. Best of luck to the listeners. We will be back next week with one tournament. That is the Valero Texas Open. The curtain raiser for the 2024 Masters. Enjoy your golf betting. See you soon. If you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf 